Um, yeah, small session here, so we're we're gonna let people, you know, keep their mics on or off and ask questions if they want. Um, I'll just go through what we're we're sort of planning, and then feel free to jump in. Um, we're recording the session. If you need to share this with other people, and uh, yeah, if you don't want to talk, you can just shoot the uh, questions in the chat, and uh, Aaron is gonna monitor those for me. And then Aaron is also going to monitor if anybody comes in late because uh, I can't pay attention to two things at once some days. So obviously this stuff, you guys, I think everybody's been on the previous sessions. So, you know, uh, where to get more information or follow up stuff if you need. So it's me and Malik running this show. Malik's obviously the uh, the smarter of the two of us. He's had much longer with dynamics than probably anybody else combined. So I'll rely on him when I start to stumble. But here's our, our planned uh, stuff. We'll talk a little bit about UCI. Um, not going to go too deep into it because we do actually have some pre-recorded content. That's that's actually pretty good from previous things that I've done on the support side in our webinars. And we'll talk a little bit about the role-based app. We'll talk a bunch about the Power Platform Admin Center, which is new. And there's a lot of things that people might have not seen, log retention. And then we'll see where the conversation drifts after that. So on the UCI bit, uh, as I mentioned, uh, support has done a few of these sessions now, I think uh, three of them, and then we'll probably be doing another one in June and then July. We'll kind of do like a one a month. So most of these UCI changes are targeted for uh, October 2020 as sort of when everybody's going to get rolled over. So uh, yeah, we're going to make sure that customers are aware. And I've embedded both a link to the YouTube video that I'm talking about and actual presentation that I've done in the past. So let me show that to people that maybe haven't seen it. Uh, I just have to share a different screen. One sec. Okay. So on our webinars page, which is either neosystems.com or itrack365.com slash webinars. And then I usually get the better recordings that we make on there. So if you go to something like the UCI one, there'll be a 25-minute you know, long video on things that are specific just to UCI. Right. So that's there. So get back to my PowerPoint. So, but the things in UCI that most people are um, obviously noticing is all everything that they've done. So with the graphics, how they're using uh, white space, um, what they're doing with the visuals and tiles and menus and sub menus, some of the navigation control, like the uh, sitemap navigation, uh, color compliance, um, uh, the thing to do with WCAG, which is for people that are uh, visually impaired and they need high resolution uh, graphics so they can see better and things of that nature. Uh, so low visibility, low vision, that sort of thing. Um, they've designed dynamic navigation to have less clicks and scrolling. So there's more things that pop up rather than uh, going to a different menu. Uh, they've introduced auto scaling, uh, the site map, kind of like a website style navigation. Those are the things that people notice most often. They've redesigned how they do their breadcrumbs. Uh, so when you're going through the menus, uh, recent and pin menu options have been introduced and a bunch of other things. So that's the front end. So for the people that go and actually look inside of Dynamics and interact with those menus, that's what they would notice. And for the people that develop uh, on the Dynamics platform, the other bits and pieces that they've added have to do with the, ex the extendability side. So. Uh, integration or uh, with common data services, the embedded APIs, the ability to uh, develop power apps and things of that nature, right? So I think a lot of that people have probably seen or at least read about. Uh, if not, I'll mention a couple things here. So this would be an example of the type of improved visuals. The component framework a layer that sits on top of Dynamics just lets you design better dials, switches, sliders, etc. So it's been improved to be more flexible for future development. And a lot of the development that's happening is meant for the mobile platform. So obviously you want to be cognizant of the, what the buttons uh, do and how they look. So that way people are interacting with it in a, in a better sense. And then also on the 
the redesign of the platform, they've they've focused on improving performance. Again, that does somewhat play into the mobile side of things uh, because you need um, you know things to be less uh, heavy as far as the requirements of downloading things like graphics, right? So this, I went through one of their Microsoft presentations and pulled out this slide. They talk about the loading times, right? So that's big, the grid loads, the data loads, et cetera. And they figure with this new UCI, this is the improvements that they're getting, right? So this is, this is their stats, not mine, okay? And another thing that we'll talk about uh, here in a sec when I'll jump into my browser is their whole idea about role-based apps. So what Microsoft is driving towards is they're saying that when you do the app development or what they call app development um, you design it to be kind of integrated with the security components so if i'm a system administrator versus a project manager versus a field supervisor versus a person in hr health and safety person sales etc um, i should be able to get my own app so to speak so whether i'm deploying that app on a mobile or just on a portal doesn't really matter i kind of have my own access and that gives me my own menus all right that's sort of big about what they want to do that's how they want to encourage people to develop going forward and we in our own app development are also probably going to start doing kind of this stuff uh, so we have a session tomorrow on sort of where the ui on the mobile apps is going so some of that will be covered in sort of in that nature as well so for people that sort of follow along with what microsoft has been doing with dynamics you probably would have seen these things so they're they're not totally new to you but if you haven't seen it uh, this is just kind of screenshot with some examples where the navigation so if i'm just doing nothing but business forms uh, form types of that nature i would have my own menu and that's all i need to see if i'm an administrator i would see all of the above right i'd see forms training operations sales etc and each one of those things would have these different components built in and then that way your navigation in theory is more intuitive than it used to be before you move on uh, move on yeah. just go ahead comment. So right now with iTrack, we have really two model, they're called model driven apps, the apps that run from inside. So that's where you would, you know, author your form type, look at your employees, set up all your master data. So really we include two. We have one called iTrack Hub, kind of has like everything in it. You need to use iTrack. And we have the HR one, which is a slight variation on the first one. So really you should look at creating your own apps from apps kind of role based because that big one is probably good for someone who uses iTrack kind of every single day and is always in iTrack but for the users who don't go into iTrack all that much through the dynamics interface you probably want to build them out their own app and just include the components that they kind of use day to day and then they can go back to the to the big iTrack hub one for things that they might use you know once in a once a year or just for at the beginning for setup yeah and really it's not something you would need a developer for they even call the url is it's a maker portal so it's really a non-developer kind of some way some technical knowledge you should be able to set these up so i want to include some in the product in the future so i'd, I'd appreciate some input on what kind of role based um, apps we should be creating yeah so and this is kind of you know what I think you're talking about, Malik. So when you know when people log in, they would see a self-contained um, app, and that's that's what we're talking about there. Yeah, so anybody used to the old interface, they kind of took the interface and they call that a model-driven app now. So it's still kind of the same thing, just different look and feel, but basically it's the same thing still. Yeah. But what that also allows you to do, just to add. One last thing is if a user only uses iTrack, they can log into the iTrack app and all they see is the iTrack components. They don't see like before when they used to see sales, um, marketing, the service. They just see that that small subset of things that they would need to use. Yeah. Yeah, it's just about basically making things neater and tighter. I think that's that's the way to look at it. If you think about well, how the people are going to interact with it you can just line it up so that everything works without having to you know worry whether you've given a person too much control so for for people for anybody that hasn't had a chance to look at the uci this is sort of the new look and feel 
So there's been a bunch of redesign. So the site map style navigation, so the left hand controls. So before you'd click the, the breadcrumb at the top, it drop down a menu. That's where you would see things. Now everything's on the left. And you can obviously, if you want more space, you can hide or expand those choices. And then they've introduced, like I mentioned, recent and things that you can pin. So you've got frequently accessed menus. Um, you can use those. And then, uh, yeah, everything else is based on your sort of security role. So right here, down here is where it would be those self-contained things like training, operations, sales, et cetera, right? So as I'm going through there, you select it, go through, and it changes what I see on the left, right? So as far as the UI itself, um so the breadcrumb has changed so as i drilled into the various menus that would be showing up in the breadcrumb and then um when you drill in further that breadcrumb will grow which is uh, a better way of doing the breadcrumb than what it currently is um they've moved around where the icons sit uh so some of the things have moved out of the top row have moved to the top or vice versa but generally it's similar to what people would be using now with what they call the legacy um, web app and uh, for things that are grids so these boxes those in a lot of forms bring in information across from a different place uh, in the system so you don't have to go to that menu to see that information and then everything else is about white space and uh, like again loading and things of uh, the performance improvements and so this is an example of the auto rescaling so if I design this to be used on an iPad or a mobile phone or whatever. So if I change the window size, it then rescales the menu. So instead of being wide, they just drop down below. And again, if you resize to full, such as if you're working on the desktop, it again resizes dynamically. So that means from a development standpoint, if you develop something for the desktop, chances are it'll probably work on the mobile just as easily just because it does these things automatically. Right. So like I mentioned that we, we've done these webinars before, so there's plenty of information. Um, my presentation that I've got embedded inside of this one has lots of it. So um, hopefully that'll give people more than enough info, but you're more than welcome to uh, send your questions. So if there's nothing else about the UI, and again, stop me if, uh, if people have questions, we're going to talk about the Power Platform Admin Center. So maybe um, there's been a bunch of changes and not everybody has seen them. So we'll go over some of the things that are in here. And then uh, if you have questions, we can talk about those. So this uh, first screen is kind of like a dashboard. It gives you a lot of summary. Uh, it talks about whether your tenant is over capacity, you know, what's taking up the, the space. Is it the database? Is it the file? Is it the log? So uh, you may be able to, at a glance, get a sense of uh, you know, what is it in the system that's uh, hogging all your space? And uh, beyond that, you can then start drilling into it uh, further to see this information. So if you go into the storage capacity tab, select an environment that you want to look at and click this graphic icon next to it. So um, sure, production, why not? What I'll do is I'll go and fetch the information. And I'll just give it a second here while it spins its wheels. Right, and then it brings up all the uh, processes and it shows you the statistics saying that, you know, under database usage, this is what's going on. And then if you scroll down, you'll see files usage, you know, it'll tell you what's going on and then further down log usage, right? So this covers all the basic information now into the higher form. And if you wanna uh, download the, the screenshot uh, for like to insert it into a presentation or the table underneath it, you can do that from this screen as well. So that's the capacity tab. So I'm actually going to jump back one to environments. Uh, this is sort of the, the more high level one, but it's less interesting. So I, I went with capacity first. So this will show you again what environments you have, your production, your sandbox, your demo, whatever. And this is where you're able to drill into and do some of the things like backups and copies and um, uh, refreshes and anything else. Give it a second here. Hmm. 
slow today. There we go. So if you pick one of these environments, and from the capacity screen, you can actually click on the uh, environment name, but here you can. And uh, I'll do that in a second, but you can also see that there's a shortcut to options like open the environment, go to settings, uh, connect to the resources associated with that instance, uh, convert sandbox, backup, copy, delete, right? So let me just drill into one of these. There you go. So this is sort of the extra information and the extra menu controls. So gives you the name, region, production, database version, et cetera, right? So you find out uh, what the situation is with the updates, et cetera. Uh, there'll be another screen. I'll come back here in a minute, but uh, let me just actually eh, fly through some of the other ones first. Maybe I'll leave this tab open and open another one to make it easier for myself. So now we're getting into the, the analytics side of things. On the left here, what I selected was common data service. And in here, you'll see that, that there's a bunch of tabs that talk about um, number of active users, number of API calls, pass rates, et cetera. And again, this is all statistics that it pulls together with the Power BI backend. And you're able to see by user, you know, how many people are doing what, uh, who's performing the most operations, which plugins are failing, et cetera. And if I go through these tabs, each one will subsequently give me more information. So here's one on the active users, operations, and then I'll just go down to the next one, which would be mode of access. And again, you can see it's loading four separate uh, panels, and it's giving you different information on each one. And then as you keep going, you'll notice kind of the same the same thing happening. Each one's got different information, different dashboard, similar to what you know you would notice in other parts of Dynamics. Uh, very similarly constructed with the visuals. Uh, and there wouldn't be too much here that people wouldn't understand just by going in and looking, right? And so on these uh, filters, as you can see here, it's showing data where it's coming from when it was pulled. And if you needed to modify uh, just to see the different uh, date range or something like that along those lines, you click change filters, it brings out a panel and here you can change the date range from where you're grabbing the information. Okay. So I'll hit up a couple more of these tabs. Here's one on plugins. API call statistics. And mailbox usage. There you go. So that's everything under the common data service option. And then we got two more here, one called Power Automate and Power Apps, but it's essentially just a continuation of what we saw with the common data service, it just gives you statistics, information on, you know, usage, errors, connection issues, et cetera, et cetera. And it's done the same way. It pulls it with API based on your filter selection, right? So let's see if this will load. No data available based on the filters. That's all right. And then again, I'll go into Power Apps, but much of it will be the same, right? Usage, errors, service performance, connectors, that sort of thing. So for people that are interested in sort of the back end, what's happening from the connection standpoint, especially if you're used to the way that Microsoft designs things, this would be fairly familiar. It's just nicely laid out and you're able to get more information at a glance. So uh, any questions on that before we move in and talk about some of the other settings? Okay, if anybody thinks of a question, feel free to put it in chat but I went back to the environments tab that I had up open earlier, and now we're gonna click on one of the, the, the settings things here. And this is where you can see some of the sort of the other information once you need to dig in into the environment further. So the, the earlier screen had high level uh, stuff, and this is where you can drill into all the other stuff to do with the way that settings are done, the way permissions are done, auditing and logs, and um, other information like that. Okay. So let me make sure that we've covered everything. So I'm going to just jump back to my PowerPoint. Uh, settings, 
OK, all right. So auditing would be sort of the next bit that we want to talk about. So going to the settings, going into the auditing settings. So if you click on settings, you'll see something there to do with audit settings. And uh, like in my case, I found out I didn't have permission, but certainly Malik would. And uh, you'd be able to see that information. So in there as uh, bits and pieces about um, the auditing controls. So if you want to start auditing and it's not turned on, that this is where you activate it. And then you can look at the logs. Um, so the user sign in would be an example of that and then viewing of records. All right, so that gives you a bit more granular control. And I think from the way that I understood it, and Malik, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that this granularity wasn't there before. So maybe talk a little bit about this and how it's different. Some of it was some of it was there, like you could start the auditing, you could log um, some of the access. The read logs is pretty new. So that's where you could see which records are being viewed by which users. Um, also, there's some more granularity on the entities. So you can choose um, what type of auditing you do per entity. Yeah. yeah. Um, the other part to note, though, is um, now that the storage is now broken up into three pieces, it's broken up into um, database, a file, and log. Log being probably the most expensive, and you probably get the least set of that included in your plan. Um, so all your logs, just like before, they're stored in uh, batches of 90 days. And really, you can only delete the oldest batch at a, in really one batch at a time. And up to, uh, yeah, so the next slide kind of lists that out. Um, so you would probably want to develop a policy for your for your organization that says, you know, we keep all our log logs for, you know, X number of days or X, X number of months or years or whatever and try to clean them up kind of monthly or every every three months just to reduce cost. Yeah. So yeah, so that's basically log management. And I think that's essentially everything that we planned on covering. So open for questions. I'm not sure if people have any uh, additional. If not, we'll, uh, we'll let people go a little bit early. But certainly, if uh, if you're not familiar, seeing some of these changes, um, this information is going to it's still fairly new, so there'll be more stuff that trickles out from Microsoft on it. So if we find stuff that's uh, interesting or relevant, we'll start highlighting that in either our communications or webinars or things of that nature as well. So no questions. Everybody comfortable? All right, so we'll just wrap up. Um, if people are interested in seeing more technology sessions, we could I could think of about four more that would be kind of along the same lines. So tomorrow at one o'clock our time, uh, we've got a session on the AI builder process flow automation uh, and the way we were presenting it. We're talking about scanning paper and uh, bringing that into mapped eye track forms. So that'll be a, a demo. Then there's also a demo on our training app, and which will essentially highlight the future UI that our apps are likely to take. Uh, that's also at the same time tomorrow, so you got to pick one or the other. There's also a session on the workflow engine. That's at 1:45, and there'll be a session for uh, I track hidden treasures, which will cover some bits and pieces, but that won't be about dynamics. It'll be more about I track and some maybe features that people don't know about as much. And uh, obviously, everybody's probably seen the, um, the conference uh, schedule, but if you haven't, uh, feel free to check that website out and see if there's any of the other sessions that are interesting to you. And then if you've got questions you can't think of now, but want to shoot us an email later, um, we'll have plenty of opportunity to do that as well. So we'll just leave it here for a little bit uh, if anybody thinks of anything, but otherwise, Thank you for your time. Hopefully that was 